Well, we are uh, very excited to have each of you here. This is uh, our main leadership training we do um, each year now. It's the second year we've done it. We're going to be doing it each year to kick off our ministry year. Um, the reason we do it is we uh, really want to make sure that, that we as leaders are on the same page, regardless of the ministry that we're in. So some of you uh, serve in children's ministry or the preschool ministry. Uh, some of you are doing adult ministry. Some are youth ministry. Some are women's ministry, men's ministry. But all of us should be on the same page as far as uh, what we're to be as a church, where we're going as a church. And this gives us a chance to, uh, to do that, to get on the same page, to talk, to, uh, to pray together, and, uh, and to uh, learn some things um, about uh, the church and the ministry uh, that we are called to here in Dallas, Oregon. Uh, this year, we're going to be uh, talking uh, specifically about the mission of Grace Church, um, what we've defined as the mission, and then how we're going to accomplish that mission. Um, the, the second session, after a break, Ben is going to talk about the gospel and how that impacts uh, discipleship. Um, and then the final session is going to be uh, on gender dysphoria and uh, how that impacts the ministry of the church, something that is very prevalent uh, today, very important for us to talk about, um, as it's going to impact every ministry at some level at some point uh, in the future. So as we get started, though, I just want to tell you I'm, I'm really uh, blessed to have each of you here this morning. Um, I know taking a chunk of uh, Saturday in early September, uh, right after college football's you know started, is, is a difficult thing, and kids are now back at school, and but it's so important for us as leaders to gather and to, uh, to build each other up. Um, I think of Ephesians chapter 4, uh, in verse 11, it says this, And he, that is God, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God to mature to manhood. And so... You guys are those who do the ministry of Grace Church. Us pastors and, and the elders and, and others, we, we do some ministry, but our main ministry is to equip you to do the ministry of the church because we can't be in every kid's classroom or student small group or adult small group, women's Bible study. We need you to lead the ministries of Grace Church. And so gathering together like this gives us a chance to, uh, as the saints who are doing the work of ministry, to, to learn, to, to unify, to, to move forward together, to better execute the mission of helping each other attain a maturity in Christ. This morning as we get started, we're going to be talking about this. What are we working to accomplish as a church? What are we working to accomplish as a church? So right off the bat, I'm going to give you a chance, just a couple of minutes to talk around your tables about these two questions. First, what are things that churches could work to accomplish? I'm not saying should, I'm saying could. So throughout anything and everything you've ever heard churches do or, or work towards, uh, whether you think it's a good idea or not, just anything they could possibly be about. And then secondly, what are things your specific ministry could work to accomplish? Again, anything and everything, just throw it out there. Just get a bunch of ideas ready, set, go. Oh, a word or two. What are things churches could be about? Just to shout them out. Homeless. What? Growth. Love. Jesus. Okay, get more specific than Jesus, okay? <laughs> It's all, it's all about Jesus. I'm saying could. I'm not saying should. Could. Anything. Justice. Justice. What else? Social club. Social club. Community outreach. Community outreach. World peace. World. There you go. <laughs> Falling in love with people who leave. Legalism. Legalism. Okay. Good. Politics. Politics. <laughs> They, yeah, get people's money, right? Get the get the, the pastor a yacht and a and a private jet, right? What else? Big bit, you know, build big buildings. No. Social justice, feed the homeless, counseling services. I mean, you could go on and on. We could probably come up with a list that's you know pages long of things that we could be about as the church. So we need to talk about what we should be about. Because 
while all those things, you know, except for getting the pastor a, a yacht, are, are good ideas, <laughs> and maybe legalism and a couple other things that were thrown out, most of those things were good ideas. Are they what the church is to be about? I want you to think about this. I need uh, Jeff, come up here. Grab a finger dart for me. All right? Grab a finger dart. I want you to stand back near the camera, get a little distance from the screen. I want you to hit the target on the screen. Oh, you want to see the target that's on the screen. It would be helpful to know what the, where the target is, right? Okay. There you go. Get the target on the screen. Which one did? You can't fail, man. Get the target. It's very, it's, it's a very simple thing. Hit the target. All right, how's that? There you go. Hit the target. Now, as simple it is to hit a target, when you see the target, you can identify the target, know what the target is. If you first can't see what the target is, you don't know what you're shooting at, then it's impossible to accomplish the task. And when you have many different targets, you might accomplish it, but how do you know if you did? You hit a target, but did you hit the target? Now notice, it's interesting, with this big target, it encompasses some of the smaller targets. We're not just about one thing necessarily, but the things that we are to be about should be about the one thing that the church has been called to. I like this quote from Eric Geiger in the book Simple Church. He says, many of our churches have become cluttered. So cluttered that people have a difficult time encountering the simple and powerful message of Christ. So cluttered that many people are busy doing church instead of being the church. These churches are experiencing ministry schizophrenia. <laughs> have any of you been in a church like that? There's tons of stuff going on. And they pride themselves on, on all the stuff that they're doing. But at the end of the day, are they doing what the church has been called to do? Because the church was not our idea. The church is not to be in, in you know, our image about what we think is best. The church is Jesus's. He established the church. He's the one that has promised to grow the church. He's the one who is the, the king, the head of the church. The chief shepherd, as it says in 1 Peter. That is the senior pastor of the church. And so if Jesus is the senior pastor of the church, we should follow what Jesus says the church is to be about. So, for the next few minutes, before break, we're going to talk about what are the things that we should be working to accomplish. What are the things that we should be working to accomplish? And for that, we go back to Scripture. Specifically, the words of Jesus. And from the words of Jesus, we, as a leadership, have put together our mission methods and metrics through which we can accomplish ministry here in Dallas, Oregon. So here's the, uh, the biblical foundations of Grace Church. What we do and why we do it. And we take it from two passages um, where Jesus is speaking to his followers. And he says a couple of very important things. In fact, it's so important that we call these the great passages. The great commandment and the great commission. The great <laughs> commandment in Matthew chapter 22, verse 35. A lawyer comes up to Jesus and he asks a question to test him. Verse 36. Teacher... Which is the great commandment in the law? So you have all the laws of the Old Testament. This lawyer is trying to figure out what Jesus is all about. What's the most important one, Jesus? And what does Jesus say? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. That last statement is very important. On these two commandments depends all the law and the prophets. The Bible up to that point would be referred to as the law and the prophets. That's the Old Testament. That's the Bible they had. And Jesus is saying the entire Bible is about these two things. Love God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. Secondly, the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus has died, rose from the grave. He's about to ascend into heaven. These are some of the last words he speaks to his disciples before he leaves. Not to return until the end times. This is what Jesus said. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I came to earth according to the will of God. I lived a perfect life. I died a death in your place. I have risen from the grave. I'm about to be exalted 
as the king supreme over the entire universe, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, this is important stuff. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus commissions and sends his followers into the world to do what he did. Now they are to be on the mission of Jesus, a mission Jesus started, that they are to continue, that their followers will continue, that their followers will continue, and now we are to continue. The Great Commission. And it's through these two passages that we have formulated what we are to be about as Grace Church. Now, a lot of churches have, may, may say this a little different or have a little different focus. For Grace Church, this is what we are to be about. Anyone know what our mission is? Can you tell us our mission? Yep, worshiping God by making disciples. That's what we're to be about. Worshiping God by making disciples. Worshiping God, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Matthew 22. Making disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28. That's our mission. That's what we're to be about. Everything we do should be about worshiping God and making disciples. We define disciples in this way. Disciples are followers of Jesus who worship, serve, grow, and reproduce. Worship, serve, grow, and reproduce. These are the things that we are to be about. Now, why do we pick these words? Why these things? Because they come straight from the Great Commandment and Great Commission. And we, because we believe that disciples um, are to do these things, we as a church that is a gathering of disciples, followers of Jesus, are to also be about these things. So the, the church is to be about what the people are to be about. And so we are using these things as our methods to accomplish the mission of Jesus. Every ministry we do is to be about worship, service, spiritual growth, and reproducing ourselves, that is making more and more disciples. So, here's how we get that. Matthew 22, again. Worship, or worship is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Everything we do should be done out of love for the Lord. A passionate love for, for God, for Jesus Christ, for the Holy Spirit. A desire to, to accomplish His mission here. And it's to be with everything we are, heart, soul, and mind, all of us is to be following Jesus, is to be worshiping, is to be worshiping. I think of uh, Romans chapter 12, right? Romans chapter 12, great passage. I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. <laughs> Offering your body your life on an altar, just as they would bring their offerings to the temple and offer their offerings. Now, we are the offerings, not a burnt offering, a living offering. Therefore, our heart, soul, and mind, everything that we are, is sacrificed to the Lord. And that, we are told here, is your spiritual worship. So worship, we are to be about worshiping, and not just singing worship songs. It's everything we do, it's who we are. It's being about the mission of God. It's about following His Lordship in our lives. Then serving. Matthew 22, 39. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. We should serve each other. That worship of God leads to service of others. We are to view other, other people how Jesus views them. And we are to love them in that way and serve them in that way. And again, those two commandments summarizes the entire law and prophets. The, the, the scriptures up to that point... All say these two things in different ways. And then grow. Matthew 28, 20. So the disciples that are made, we are to teach them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. We are to be teaching disciples. When someone accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior, that's not the end of our mission. So many times we think, okay, I got them into the kingdom, right? They're not going to hell. Mission accomplished. Now I'm going to move on. No. The mission doesn't end. We are to then teach them to observe all that Jesus commanded them. And then, of course, reproduce, go, therefore, and make disciples. We are to see disciples made, but once they're made, we are to see them grow, and then eventually become those who are reproducing themselves in others. As we produce our, reproduce ourselves in someone else, they are to reproduce themselves in someone else, and that journey continues. It doesn't end 
We, we are not going towards a specific destination this side of heaven. We're, we're not taking them through a certain amount of classes or, or get them to a certain stage and say, okay, we, we've won. We, we arrived. Now I can move on. My mission is done. No, the mission actually doesn't end. And so, to summarize, the goal is to set a direction, not arrive at a destination. We don't have, you know, the, the, the 100, 200, 300, 400 level classes, and once they graduate 400, then you're good. You've been discipled. You've arrived. You're mature. No, we keep going. It, is, it never ends. Uh, Daniel M. in his book, No Silver Bullets, he writes this. A church that focuses on destination is one that measures the maturity of disciples based on how much they have achieved, what they know, their observable behaviors, and whether they have completed certain classes. The destination-focused church has clear metrics for success that are objective and outward in nature. Now there's some comfort there, right? Because we can look at someone and say, okay, we see these things in your life, you have this amount of knowledge, you have accomplished these tasks and completed these classes, therefore we classify you as mature because we can measure these things. Now, it's good to have metrics to measure growth and things, but that's not all that we are going for. It says, by contrast, a church that focuses on direction is one that sees maturity as an ongoing process without an endpoint this side of eternity. Maturity is first measured by the direction the disciple is moving, towards Christ or away from Christ, and then how far along they are in that journey. As a result, the direction-focused church has broader metrics for success that are both objective, they are measurable, and subjective, not measurable, in nature. So... As we are on this mission together to see disciples made, disciples grown, disciples deployed, it's really important that we realize that the destination is not the goal. Instead, it's the direction that they are heading. Because if we only have a destination in mind, then when someone is going slower towards that destination, we get frustrated. Have you ever been there? Man, just get it, please. We want you here, and you're not here fast enough. Or those who zip through the classes and seem to be growing really fast, woo, good job, you guys are awesome. But how many times have we seen the people that seem to grow really fast, and they hit a destination, and we send them out, and then a few years down the road, they flamed out. Whereas the person who is taking so much time, so much energy, so frustrating, so many ups and downs, but over the course of years, you see significant growth and development in their life. You see God uh, creating them to be uh, you know, a follower of Him and, and, and making them more and more in His image, like Jesus. That's, that's what we are to be about. We're about helping people move towards Jesus. And some people are going to move fast, some will move slow, but it never ends until Jesus comes back. So here are some metrics that we have uh, laid down, some of the, the observable metrics that we want to, to use to help people uh, know where they're at and, and help you understand where those that you were discipling are at, and, and also give you some goals to shoot for. And so here are some of them. Gospel-centered transformation. Gospel-centered transformation. This is something Ben's going to talk about in the next uh, session, so I'm not going to go into that. He'll explain what that means. But we do want to see people changing by the gospel. That's what that means. Authentic community. Authentic community. What, what does that say to you? A couple people. What, what's authentic community versus some other kind of community? Yeah. True friendships, not facial. You know, yeah. Pat on the back. Yeah. Go away. Good. Good. More than just the surface level. Hey, how you doing? Great. Right. Showing the bad and the good. Okay, good. I'm not trying to put a front, but it's all happy all the time. Right. It's not that easy. Yeah. And there needs to be significant trust to be able to have those kind of authentic, transparent relationships, right? You're not going to share your deepest, darkest secrets or the things that you're struggling with, the, 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 the highs and the lows, unless you trust the people. And so there's a significant amount of trust to form that kind of community. And it's developed over a long period of time. It doesn't happen instantaneously, right? Good. 
Sacrificial service. So when we say we want to see our people serve, worship, serve, or reproduce, uh, there's a lot of people in our world that serve, right? We see celebrities serving, oftentimes writing a check, right? Or, or you know, protesting something and raising awareness for something or whatever it is. There can be a, an easy level of service. We want to see sacrificial service, service that actually hurts when you do it, that you're giving something up. You're giving up your, your time, talent, treasure to serve others and therefore serve the Lord. Prayerful dependence. We, we need to make sure that everything we do is bathed in prayer and that we are teaching the people that we are discipling how to pray, the importance of prayer, why we pray. I think, I think so much of what we see in the church today and, and our church, other churches, the struggles that we go through can be tracked back to a lack of prayerful dependence. We're doing it in our own strength. We're, we're, we're trying to rely on our own wisdom or strategies or, or whatever. And we spend way more time talking strategy than, than praying. What if we flip that? Strategy is important, don't get me wrong. But what about prayer? Are we relying on God to do the work? In everything we do, are we teaching our people to rely on the Lord as they lead their families, as, as they raise their kids, as they go to work, as our, as our kids go to school, as they play sports, as they, uh, as they you know, do their other activities, as they hang out with friends? Are we teaching them to, to approach everything in life with a prayerful dependence, a reliance on God to use them, to grow them? Relational discipleship. Back to the authentic community. We want to see people discipled, that is, become better followers of Jesus, but we want to see that done in the context of relationship. You saw Jesus disciple his, his 12 followers in relationship. He spent time with them. They ate together. They, they, they uh, walked you know, from destination to destination together. They served together. They, they did everything together. For three years, they were inseparable. And you see the impact that Jesus had on, on 12, 11, and then those on others. Relational discipleship. Multi-generational ministry. But we don't just want to see our church pigeonholed in, in being a young church or an old church or a, a young family's church or a, 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 any particular kind of church. We want to see the generations represented because we believe that if we're to see relational discipleship happen, if we're to see authentic community, if we're to see gospel-centered transformation, it's going to be done as we see Scripture lay out with older discipling younger, with those who are more mature discipling those who are less mature. And we need the generations to do that. And so just looking around this room and seeing, um, you know, all ages represented and, and those who are going to be leading and serving those in our church, that just thrills me because that's what we desire here, a multi-generational ministry. That anyone of any age can walk into our church and find people like them. City engagement. We don't want to just be huddled here you know, in the church building. We want to go out and engage Dallas. We want to engage those outside of our church. So we, we do things like I Serve last year, where, where we just spent a whole morning on a Saturday out serving the parks and the schools and the fire department and others in our community because we want to be engaged with our city. We want to see the people of our city Think about Grace Church and think good things, right? So many times you hear of people who hear about a church and they think negative things. We want Grace Church to be thought of in a positive way. It goes back to Acts 2 where it says that they had favor with all the people. Why? Because they were blessing the community. They were blessing those around them. And we want to be that kind of church. We, we often will say in our, our leadership meetings, if Grace Church were to be suddenly removed from Dallas, other than our people, would we be missed? Would we, we be missed at all? Would people even notice we were gone? We hope so. And we hope that, that would, the, the result would be people mourning the loss of Grace Church. And so we want to engage our city. And then we want to engage our world, world missions. We want to take the resources we've been blessed with, and we want to help those around the world. And so we support missionaries. We send missions teams and, and all of those things. We pray for missionaries. And that's from the kids all the way up. You know, kids supporting. Um, Carissa, who are we supporting right now? Kids-wise. Uh, 
take it. Yeah. Actually, we support many different things. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But for a long time, we had um, yeah, Wendy, had right? Yeah. And uh, then we saw him graduate and move on. Now we're supporting other things. The youth have a couple Compassion First kids. I know a lot of people in our church support Compassion First kids. Uh, just other things. Uh, the, the money we raised to help Compassion First start their new rescue shelter that they're in the process of getting off the ground. We want to engage around the world in, in helping the gospel to impact this world around us. So those are the metrics that we uh, want to lay before you and say, these are things that we are to be about. So now, uh, for the next uh, five, uh, seven minutes, I want you to talk around your tables about these things. And I want you to talk about, in your areas of ministry, what are, what are a couple of these that you're already doing well, that you're excited about? If you're new, uh, maybe you don't have that context yet, so listen to others in your area of ministry. But also maybe look at a couple of these and say, what are one or two of them? that this year we're really going to focus our efforts on. Because I guarantee if you're leading a life group or a you know, fifth grade boys class or whatever, if you try to do all eight this year and engage in all eight, you probably are going to come at the end of the year and think, and we didn't really do that much. But if you focus on one or two of these and say, man, we really want to be about this. Number one would be gospel-centered transformation. Ben will talk about that. That should be done at, you know, in all the groups. But beyond that, what are some of these things we really want to hone in on and develop this year? So talk for the next five to uh, seven minutes in your groups about these things. Just a couple of thoughts from, from a few of you summarizing your conversation from a couple of the tables. Claire and I heard you summarize really good. What well, summarize your conversation? <laughs> well, I was just listening to Amy. What did you just say? Say what I summarize your conversation. What are your thoughts just in um, 20 seconds. In the high school ministry, oh my gosh, 20 seconds. Uh, we feel like we're a pretty good at authentic community because we allow time for the kids to um, talk about the sermon on Tuesday nights afterwards. We break out into small groups. We actually have to hear from the kids after that. Mm -hmm. um, but we have an opportunity in sacrificial service and city engagement because it would be really easy to always be having opportunities for... Um, uh, for service or, uh, you know, like community service or, you know, helping someone in the church. Um, but I just don't see that as often. Okay, so, good. Yeah. Good. A different ministry. Summarize some a table from a different ministry. Yeah, Mike. We, we, uh, we're with Life Groups and I'm with the adult class. But uh, what we're talking about is the gospel project that we're doing in the adult class is really focused on number one, the gospel center transformation. Mm -hmm. And then what you want to see is that sacrificial service. I mean, if you think about Christ and people himself, it really brings all that into life. Yeah, so implications of the gospel. Right. This is what Jesus did, therefore we go and do, right? And, and we did notice that coping was not a... Was not a <laughs> coping, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> coping, <laughs> making it through the week, yeah. That's not, not one of our objectives. Good, yeah. Take all eight of these and the uh, statement that you've made before that <coughs> some move faster through their Christian walk in their life and others move slowly and if you cannot connect those two others want, that are moving faster maybe want to move on or fall away like you said right if you cannot connect those and keep keep those groups going together those different aspects yeah it's good and, people's lives. and helping the the ones who who are growing faster to not uh, not resent the ones going slower, right? Instead, maybe give those who are growing faster more responsibility, some more leadership in the group, maybe pair them with someone who's less mature, so then that develops their the maturity even more in a leadership sense. So yeah, it's really good. Others? Other ministry? Maybe someone from uh, kids ministry? I'll yeah. <laughs> We had an authentic community. We have a lot of kids at so many different schools around here. We have yeah. a homeschool that, um, you know, if you come from Sheridan Homeschool and you're in the Dallas uh, church, you're typically going to have Dallas school kids. So creating an environment where they can feel comfortable and this is a place where, uh, where they can belong. Yeah, that's fantastic. Kids ministry is difficult because they're divided by grades, gender oftentimes. You're right, schools during the week. and So how do you bring all those kids together and in large groups, small groups, and form that that authenticity. And help kids understand what that even means, right? That's difficult, so good. Women's ministry? Well, prayerful goodness, we think we're doing well with our Gals and Grace page. We ensure prayer requests quite frequently. Um, our authentic community, we've been working hard at establishing safe places. Good. To the 
discuss. We could do better in sacrificial service and world missions. Good. Great. Great. In just the last uh, five minutes, how should you make disciples? If, if worshiping God by making disciples is ultimately what we're all about. We, all of us, regardless of the ministry, um, are to be discipling others. That is helping others follow Jesus. And Ben will talk about that a little bit more in the next session. But on, uh, on the second page there, we, uh, we did this last year. If you uh, came to the training last year, so I'm just going <laughs> to review it. If uh, this is your first time to one of these, then uh, you can read through the full handout and the verses there. But if we're talking about how we should make disciples, let's talk about how Jesus made disciples. How did Jesus make disciples? Because ultimately, he was the best disciple maker. Can we agree with that? He, he discipled uh, world changers, right? Those who literally have changed our world. And we sit here as a result of those disciples of Jesus. And so how did he do it? Um, and Ben came up with this last year. This is uh, loosely based on the uh, um, Robert Coleman's uh, Master Plan of Evangelism. Uh, but he made it uh, a little more memorable and, and simple for, for us to follow. And so Jesus made followers this way. He chose to focus on a few. Focus on a few. He had, you know, the, the multitudes... And then he had, you know, a, a smaller group, the 120 or whatever. And then he had uh, the, the 72, I believe. And then he had uh, the, the 12. And then he had the 3. And then he had Peter, right? And, and so he had all these, these groups of people all the way down to just a couple that he really invested in. He focused on a few. And um, how much more impact can there be by focusing on a few than trying to lead the multitudes, Right? Um, I think it was Alan Hirsch. I'm quoting this off the top um, of my, or out of my memory, so forgive me if I get it slightly wrong. But he said something to the effect of um, having so much more significant change by focusing on 12 than trying to teach uh, 1,200. That, that by focusing on 12, Jesus changed the world. Instead of trying to focus on so many people, each of you have a smaller group of people that you are responsible for, that you are going to be discipling, whether that's a life group or a kid's class or a preschool class uh, in our preschool kindergarten, um, a nursery group, uh, a youth small group. We, we put you in smaller groups for a reason because we believe the best discipleship happens when you focus on a few. You focus on a few. Secondly, he opened up his life to them. That, that Jesus' life was, was there for his disciples. And they saw everything he did. They saw how he ate his meals. How he got away in the morning to pray. How he handled the multitudes. How he healed people. They got to ask difficult questions. Um, they were always with him for those three years. His life was theirs. If we're going to have impact, you need to open your lives to your people. He taught them how to live. Through his living, he taught them how they are to live. He told them to follow his lead. Again, it's, it's about you modeling for those you're discipling how to live. It's, it's you showing the way. It's you walking with them. Um, if they're going to follow your lead, you have to be accessible to them. He gave them opportunities to love and serve. So Jesus didn't just do it. He did it, he would model it, then oftentimes he would let his followers do it, right? Many times he would send them out to go, to go preach or to go do different things, um, to, to have responsibility. Sometimes they did great, sometimes they failed miserably, but he gave them opportunities to love and serve. And then he watched them and offered them accountability. When they did great, he, he applauded them. When they failed... He, he chastised them lovingly. He helped them see their mistake and, and how to change it and do it better. He didn't just say, oh, it's fine. You'll do better next time. No, he, he processed through it with them, right? After Peter, you know, walked on water, great moment, and then sunk, terrible moment, right? Jesus lovingly, graciously held them accountable for taking his eyes off of Jesus, right? He expected them to eventually make disciples. There, there was an expectation of this is going somewhere. This is the direction idea. This is going somewhere. That, the, that you arriving at maturity is not the, the end goal. That you are then to reproduce yourself and continue this to keep it going. And then he told them to rely on the Holy Spirit. So as they were sent out, Jesus said, I will be with you always. How is that possible? 
Because he sent the Holy the power to do what Jesus has called them to do. And so we need to be relying on the Holy Spirit. That goes back to the prayerful dependence. But we also need to train our people, to teach our people how to rely on the Holy Spirit. So for the last uh, two minutes, <laughs> three minutes, who helped you become and grow as a disciple of Jesus how did you see them use um, these different principles? They probably weren't aware that they were, um, at least not in this format, but how did you see them use those principles in discipling you? And then what is one goal you have for your area of ministry this year? Pray around the table. So we're going to um, go from this into a break, and then Ben will kick off. So discuss for a couple minutes. If you have to do a bathroom break, a refill, a refuel, do that, and then we'll come back together, and Ben will continue our time together.